Born in Georgia to a wealthy and influential family, Jefferson Randolph Smith's life took a turn when his family lost everything in the aftermath of the Civil War. While his brothers pursued careers in law and medicine, Smith honed his skills as a con artist, becoming adept at both short and long cons. He eventually became a notorious gangster, engaging in organized crime and operating a rigged gambling hall in Denver. This is the story of Soapy Smith, a man known for his deceitful ways. Starting his professional life as a traveling soap salesman, Soapy Smith cleverly enticed miners and townspeople by announcing that some of his soap bars contained hidden bills worth $20 or $50. With a guaranteed winner in his employ, Soapy skillfully soaked his customers while entertaining them with games like the thimble game and hustling card and pool games. Smith's criminal journey started in Fort Worth, where he not only mastered the art of the soap scam but also became skilled in card manipulation. Witnessing the demise of a renowned outlaw further fueled his determination to rely on his cunning rather than guns. Eventually, Soapy perfected his soap scam, enticing bidders with the illusion of valuable prizes while ensuring his shills protected his profits. When authorities in Fort Worth grew suspicious, he made the calculated decision to relocate his operations to Denver in 1879. In an effort to avoid personal revenge or legal consequences, Soapy Smith decided to establish himself as a respectable figure in Denver. He ingratiated himself with the authorities at City Hall and took advantage of Denver's lack of gambling restrictions by running card and dice games, collecting a significant portion of the winnings. Additionally, he expanded his fraudulent activities by creating a false stock exchange, opening lottery offices with no actual winners, and organizing his men in a manner reminiscent of the Chicago gangs of the following century. By the 1880s, Soapy Smith had built a criminal empire, exerting control over most of the crime in Denver and even assisting in suppressing unsanctioned criminal activities. Smith's empire thrived in Denver thanks to his ability to manipulate local officials and portray himself as a champion of the people. He generously donated to churches and charities, allowed ministers to hold services in his saloons, and provided assistance to those in need. Additionally, he paid kickbacks to saloons and tavern keepers, controlled the liquor sales market, and even bought the loyalty of the city government and police department. In court, Soapy used his persuasive skills to defend himself, arguing that the Tivoli Club was an important institution that helped educate citizens of Denver, comparing it to the Keeley Institute's Cure for Alcoholism. He claimed credit for curing his accusers of their gambling addiction and asserted that he should be recognized as a public benefactor. Ultimately, he was acquitted. Soapy Smith tied the knot with Mary Noonan in Denver, but he made sure to keep her in the dark about his shady dealings. They had a family and lived in a respectable neighborhood, while Soapy focused his illegal activities on unsuspecting visitors to the city, leaving the locals untouched. He ran multiple establishments, including a rigged card game cigar store, all while maintaining the facade of a successful businessman to his wife and associates. With his charm and generosity, Soapy's wealth continued to skyrocket during this exciting period. Soapy's criminal activities in Denver started catching up with him as muckraking journalists began connecting him to the city's crimes. When an article mentioned his wife and family, they faced backlash from the community, prompting Soapy to send them away. In a fit of rage, he brutally attacked the newspaper's managing editor, leading to his arrest and a charge of attempted murder. Despite the evidence against him, Soapy's charm and persuasive skills helped him escape conviction once again. However, the newspaper intensified its efforts to bring down Soapy and dismantle his criminal empire. Soapy's criminal empire faced increasing pressure in the late 1880s, but he continued to expand his enterprises in Denver and other Colorado towns. However, rival gangs, his gambling addiction, and drinking problems were starting to weaken his power in Denver. Soapy made the decision to relocate his operations to the booming silver town of Creed, where he could escape the restrictions imposed on him in Denver. Soapy Smith set up his new gambling establishment, the Orleans Club, in the town of Creed. To attract locals, he advertised a petrified man, but it was just another one of Soapy's fraudulent schemes. 
Some speculated that Soapy may have been involved in the death of Bob Ford, the owner of a competing establishment, but no evidence was ever found. After leaving Denver, Soapy Smith's absence caused the drive for reform to dwindle and the city to become more civilized. However, he decided to return just in time, as a fire destroyed much of Creed. Back in Denver, Smith openly admitted to being a conman and began a new scam selling discounted railroad tickets, luring marks into rigged games of chance and making even more money. In Denver, Soapy Smith faced tough competition from the Blonger brothers, who absorbed smaller gangs and grew into a larger criminal organization. They operated saloons, storefronts, and illicit activities such as opium dens, gambling halls, and houses of prostitution. Eventually, they set up a fraudulent betting parlor and manipulated stock prices, pocketing thousands of dollars. Soapy Smith had already left Denver when Lou Blonger continued corrupting politics and running confidence schemes until his conviction in 1922. Soapy Smith, the notorious con man, found himself in a sticky situation when the newly elected governor of Colorado decided to crack down on corruption. Smith, always quick to adapt, joined forces with corrupt Denver officials to oppose the governor's efforts, even going as far as preparing City Hall for open conflict with the state militia. However, the governor managed to avoid bloodshed by recalling the militia and using the courts to remove the offending officials, though he received some criticism for his handling of the situation. Soapy Smith, ever resourceful, managed to retain his position as a deputy sheriff, setting the stage for his next con. Governor Waits, after gaining control over Denver's government, issued orders to shut down gambling establishments and other illicit businesses. Soapy Smith, still a deputy sheriff, took advantage of the situation by leading raids on these establishments and allowing patrons to leave peacefully in exchange for leaving their money behind, resulting in a significant financial gain for himself and his men. Soapy Smith, also known as Colonel Jefferson Smith, proposed to Mexican President Porfirio Diaz the idea of forming an American foreign legion to assist in quelling rebellions in Mexico. Despite establishing a recruiting post in Denver, the idea never came to fruition. Smith and his accomplice Bascom faced charges of attempted murder in Denver, leading Soapy to flee the state and drift between Texas, California, Montana, and Portland in search of a new criminal empire. In his quest for a new mark, Soapy Smith found that many western cities were already too corrupt for a newcomer. From Butte to San Francisco to Portland, he faced familiar operations and a reputation that preceded him. However, when he arrived in Seattle in 1897, he saw a glimmer of hope amidst the gold fields of Alaska and the Yukon, where he had already made a brief, but eventful, visit to Juneau and Skagway. With a group of loyal men, he set his sights on conning his way into fortune and control of a new town. Skagway, a popular stop for those journeying to and from the gold fields, attracted people with cash on their way to prospect and those returning with riches. Soapy Smith couldn't bear the thought of all that money passing through without him getting a piece, leading him to orchestrate a scheme to free a prisoner and establish a telegraph office in the town, taking advantage of unsuspecting visitors. Soapy Smith cleverly used his telegraph office as a front for his scams, taking money from unsuspecting prospectors by offering to wire messages and then fabricating replies asking for money. To keep his operation under wraps, Soapy paid off the local newspaper and discouraged legitimate businesses from coming to Skagway. To further legitimize his activities, he opened a bar and gambling house called Jeff Smith's Parlor. Relieving prospectors of their funds, Jeff Smith's parlor operated with tables, alcohol, and rigged games of chance. Soapy's men disguised themselves as respectable citizens to welcome and befriend newly arrived prospectors, leading them to lose their money through various games. Soapy justified his actions by claiming that those who lost their money in Skagway wouldn't have survived in the gold fields anyway. Additionally, he revived his military aspirations and formed a militia, becoming captain and gaining recognition from President McKinley. Soapy Smith's military organization, the Skagway Militia Company, 
was officially recognized by the federal government during the summer of 1898, as the U.S. was at war with Spain. Sopi, as the commander, had the authority to declare martial law if necessary. Despite the fact that the Spanish forces never posed a threat to Alaska, Sopi's contribution to the war effort was leading his troops on horseback during the 4th of July parade in Skagway. However, his control over the town was not without opposition, as the citizens formed the Committee of 101 to confront him and his cronies. But Sopi, refusing to back down, continued to assert his dominance. In response to the formation of the Committee of 101, Sopi Smith formed his own group and boasted about having over 300 men. He stayed in town, waiting for miners to bring him gold, and even revived his old soap bar scheme. However, the town leadership continued to protest against his activities, as Skagway's economy relied heavily on gold from the fields. One miner, John Douglas Stewart, arrived in Skagway with a significant amount of gold and was quickly befriended by Soapy Smith's men at Jeff Smith's parlor, where he was treated to drinks, companionship, and games of chance. A visit to Jeff Smith's parlor meant spending a hefty amount of money. One unlucky miner lost $90 in cash and had his sack of gold stolen by Smith's henchmen, who were relentless in their pursuit. The town's merchants and businessmen were fed up with Soapy's antics and demanded that he return the stolen money, but he defiantly refused, claiming the miner had willingly participated in the games. The city deemed the game illegal after the cheated miner revealed his losses in a game of three-card Monty. Outraged by Smith's deceitful tactics, the opponents organized a meeting to discuss how to deal with him, prompting Soapy to initially dismiss it but eventually decide to attend armed with a rifle, confident in his persuasive abilities. Smith arrived at the meeting on Juno Wharf, carrying a rifle across his shoulder, but not threatening anyone. When he announced his intention to attend the meeting, the four men guarding the wharf refused to let him pass. Despite Smith's attempts to persuade them, an altercation broke out between Smith and one of the guards, Frank Reed. In the midst of the confrontation, Reed shot Smith multiple times, and another vigilante, Jesse Murphy, delivered a fatal shot to Smith's heart. Reed succumbed to his wounds nearly two weeks later. After Soapy Smith's death, there was confusion surrounding the events. Reed received all the credit, despite Murphy's claim of firing the fatal shot. Reed was given a hero's funeral, while Murphy was forgotten. The vigilantes were controlled by federal troops, Smith's gang was apprehended, and most of Stewart's gold was returned. Smith's body was buried outside the city cemetery, marking the end of his criminal empire. His true wealth remains a mystery, but his notorious reputation as a con man and hustler lives on.